Africans in America is a PBS documentary styled four part TV miniseries that originally aired in 1998. I remember seeing it for the first time back in the day, and I will never forget the profound effect it had on me because it filled in so many gaping holes that were created from the education I received about slavery back in school. Narrated by Academy Award nominee Angela Bassett, Africans in America tells the shared history of Africans and Europeans as seen through the lens of slavery. It is told from the perspective of the Africans who arrived in chains and who were subjected to horrific abuse and the terrible dichotomy of this new land founded on the ideal of liberty, but dedicated to the perpetuation of slavery. For whatever reason, the DVD series is unavailable to purchase, but it was also released in book format and you can purchase it from Amazon. I do believe that it is a must have for any household interested in the preservation of truth about this dark episode in American history. And I have included the purchase link in the description box below. When you make men slaves, you deprive them of half their virtue. You set them in your own conduct an example of fraud and cruelty and compel them to live with you in a state of war. Olaula Equiano, enslaved African. The promise of Britain's American colonies lay bound up in notions of what a man could own. In search of that promise, Scottish immigrant William Dunbar traveled to the American frontier in 1771. In the Mississippi Delta, he laid claim to a large tract of land, then set sail for the Caribbean. Dunbar returned with 25 African slaves to clear trees, plant indigo, and carve a plantation out of the black Delta earth. July of 1776 would find the Scotsman writing not about the newly declared American independence, but of a suspected slave revolt on his own plantation. Judge my surprise. They informed me that a conspiracy among the Negroes had been discovered and that it had taken place at my house. Dunbar was quick to take action. Within 24 hours, he hanged four men. A fifth committed suicide. But the idea of freedom did not die. In the languages of Hausa, Ja, and Wolof, Africans continued to conspire. And just eight days before, Americans had declared that all men are created equal, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were inalienable rights. How long then, in a land of such promise, could one American continue to own another? born in West Africa. He is buried in a small New England graveyard. On one side of the Atlantic Ocean, his name was Brotier. On the other, he was known as Venture Smith. He was brought to the colonies as a child. Prideful, headstrong, he was an individual of immense size and strength, a slave who was not easily controlled. Shrewd, relentless, he was one of thousands who would gain their freedom in the violent years that led to American independence. In his life is a story of America becoming. We were put on a vessel belonging to Rhode Island and told to appear to the best advantage for sale. On board, 
I was bought by one Robertson Mumford for four gallons of rum and a piece of calico cloth and called Venture on account of him having purchased me with his own private venture. Thus, I came by my name. Venture Smith. Venture Smith was one of 86,000 people who traveled to North America in the 1730s. Nearly 41,000 were Africans brought to the colonies as slaves. They were to be slaves for life, as were their children and their children's children. During those same years, 45,000 Europeans made the journey in search of opportunity. Most were poor. They paid for their passage with five to seven years of unpaid labor in the colonies. It was a hard bargain, but people came. The American colonies develop as an area of opportunity. You were not confined by who your grandfather was, who your father was, what their trades were. You could become whatever it was you chose to be, whatever your talents allowed you to be. But that notion of opportunity is premised on an unconfined freedom that in fact does not exist for the entire population, that exists for only a part of the population. By the late 1730s, one out of every six people living in the colonies was a slave. While less than a quarter of the white population owned slaves, the African trade created an economy that gave rise to other flourishing industries in the North, shipbuilding, iron foundries, sawmills, rum distilleries, and sail making. And among the well-to-do families of the South, slave labor was a way of life that began at the cradle and ended at the grave. I, Augustine Washington, being sick and weak, but of perfect sense and memory, do make my last will and testament in the manner following. I give unto my son Lawrence Washington and his heirs forever all that plantation and tract of land at Huntington Creek, all the slaves, cattle, and stock of all kinds whatsoever. I give unto my daughter Betty, a Negro child named Betty, daughter of Judy. I give unto my son George Washington and his heirs the land I now live on, which I purchased, and ten Negro slaves. In the name of God, amen. Well, Washington, from the time he was 11 years old, owned human beings. Well, that's something that he grew up with, certainly and it all revolved in his family, as most families in the Chesapeake, around agriculture and the labor required to grow large quantities of tobacco, which is a very labor-intensive crop. So from a very early age, Washington was surrounded by, by slaves. His parents owned slaves. His grandparents had been slave owners. His older brothers were slave owners. Uh, slave owning was common in the northern neck of Virginia where Washington grew up. It was just an accustomed part of life. George Washington grew up among Virginia's slaveholding aristocracy. Though he was a fourth generation American, he fashioned himself in the mold of an English gentleman with dancing lessons and fencing lessons. Like most wealthy Virginians, Washington looked to England for social custom, architecture, music, and taste. The book he studied most was Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior in Company and Conversation, a self-improvement manual compiled for 16th century noblemen. But 3,000 miles of ocean separated the colonies from Britain, and Americans were moving towards an identity that was all their own. Ambitious men like Washington's father had married into wealth, bought slaves, cleared the land, and farmed it for profit. Their sons would do the same. 
Dear sir, I will take six or more Negroes, if you can spare such, upon the terms offered in your letter. If you agree to it and will appoint a time, I would send for them, relying on your word that the whole are healthy and none of them addicted to running away. The latter I abominate, and unhealthy Negroes, women or children would not suit my purpose on any terms. George Washington. In colonial America, the acquisition of land and slaves served as a crucial step towards power and influence. Only men of property held the right to vote. They were the statesmen, they were the magistrates. Wives and daughters were expected to live under the authority of a male head of household. It was a society in which everyone, free or unfree, was expected to know his place. I was pretty much employed in the house, carding wool and other household business. My behavior had been as yet obedient and submissive. I then began to have hard tasks imposed on me or be rigorously punished. I was about nine years old. Venture Smith. As a boy, Venture Smith was learning the place of a slave on a small farm in Rhode Island. Like most children who were slaves in the North, he was growing up in the house of a white family, laboring under the supervision of his owners. Children were more likely to be employed in the household. You're helping someone so you can learn how to do whatever that thing, is, that task is, that artisan trade. You're more likely to be used in the household because, you know, you're not a threat. You're a child. Um, you're seen as more educable in the ways of the slave society. Some people, some slaveholders, think that children will be more uh, passive. As he came into his teens, Venture grew large for his age, a boy in a man's body, at six foot one and upwards of 230 pounds. He began to test those who tried to control him. My master's son, James, would come to me, big with authority, and order me to do this business and that business different from what my master had directed. These burdens were very grievous to me. One particular day, I cast a deaf ear. He broke out into a great rage and went to lay me over the head with a pitchfork. I defended myself. Otherwise, he might have murdered me in his outrage. He immediately called some people to take a rope and bind me with it. In vain, they all tried. As the fight raged on, James Mumford ran from the barn to call for more help. As I recovered my temper, I was bound and was carried before my young master that he might do what he pleased with me. A whip was fashioned from the branches of a nearby peach tree and brought to his would-be young master but James Mumford dared not raise his hand to venture again. The whip was never used. We have innumerable examples of slaveholders making protestations about a particular slave not behaving, recognizing the personality of the individuals who are enslaved. They do have their own minds. They will exercise their own will. Although the individual exercise of their own minds, the individual exercise of their own wills, does not release them from that social stratum that slavery has 
uh, imposed, that the society has imposed by declaring those persons to be slaves. In 1750, Venture turned 22 and married a woman named Meg. Tradition has it that on the occasion of their marriage, a rope was thrown over their master's house. Venture pulled at one end while Meg pulled at the other. After both had tugged for a while, Meg joined Venture and together they pulled the rope over with ease. If we pull in life against each other, we shall fail, he said, but if we pull together, we shall succeed. At year's end, Meg gave birth to a baby girl. They named her Hannah. This generation won't know Africa in the same way that their parents knew Africa. Well, the child also won't know freedom in the same way that a parent knew freedom, because a child sees daily um, the whippings, the brutality of the system, sees their parents coming under the authority, coming under the rule of the whip of the overseer, even. So it's very difficult. But at the same time, I think parents teach children what is to be cherished about the slave community, and that's family, that's religion, um, and that's togetherness. By the year of Hannah's birth, nearly two-thirds of the slave population had been born on American soil. Africans were slowly becoming a new people in a new place. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Book of Matthew. During the middle of the 18th century, a movement of white evangelical ministers made their way through Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, and parts of New England. Their sermons were a direct challenge to an established religious order in which God spoke only through a priest, a bishop, or a church official. These traveling ministers sought to remove Christianity from the elevated hands of the clergy and place it in the hearts and minds of farmhands, laborers, and servants. This was not a distant, faraway God in some kind of institutional church, but it was a God, said the evangelicals, involved in the daily lives of people, involved in every thought and every deed of your life. Themes of tyranny, slavery, and spiritual communion struck a chord in poor whites and slaves alike. Thousands flocked to hear the new gospel, and the movement became known as the Great Awakening. There'd never been anything like it. There's, here's a meeting of 3,000 people out in a field, blacks and whites together, listening to a preacher who says, here in my message and here in my story is a new life for you. Here's a new chance for you. Uh, here's a God who has your interest at heart. Here's a God who may deliver you. Though most black people in the colonies held on to traditional African beliefs, that they or their parents had carried across the ocean. The Great Awakening produced a small group of black Christian ministers. These men fused Protestant Christianity with West African ritual to take a gospel of liberation to their fellow slaves. Over a period of years, their numbers would grow. I lived a bad life and had no serious thought about my soul. I saw myself as a mass of sin. I was sin. I could not read and had no scriptures. Then I heard Brother George Leal, a man of my own color, preach. His sermon was very suitable on, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. Indeed, his whole discourse seemed for me. 
David George. The slaveholders were very weary of missionaries going amongst the Africans and baptizing them because for Africans that represented a rite of passage, a transition. Something had to change. The renowned Presbyterian minister Samuel Davies sought to calm slaveholders' anxieties by stating that there was never a good Christian yet who was a bad servant. But talk of natural rights and spiritual fellowship would charge people to step forward and question authority. One such confrontation occurred in 1752 in the kitchen of a small Rhode Island farmhouse. It was an argument between a white woman and her slaves. I was then at work in the barn. The quarrel began between my wife and my mistress. This happened when my master was gone. When I entered the house, I found my mistress in a violent passion with my wife, Venture Smith. Many, many people, whether they were black or white, whether they were rich or poor, were questioning the limits of authority. So Venture's wife is living during this era in which questioning is more possible than at some other times. What we see here is an, an argument between the mistress and a slave, and one might say, well, what could they be arguing about? Clearly, uh, the mistress says, do so, and the slave meekly, humbly does so. Well, that was not the case. I earnestly requested my wife to beg pardon of her mistress for the sake of peace. But whilst I was thus saying, my mistress turned the blows which she was repeating on my wife to me. I immediately committed the whip to the devouring fire. When Venture's owner returned home, he sought to punish his slave by sneaking up on him from behind and striking him with a club. Venture threw his master to the floor and beat him soundly. The town constable was summoned and Venture was taken to a blacksmith's shop where he was fitted for a pair of iron shackles. I continued to wear the chain peaceably for two or three days. Not anyone said much to me, until one Hempstead miner of Stonington asked me if I would live with him and that in return he would give me a good chance to gain my freedom. I said that I would. Selling a slave off is a major form of control. One person might say, I know I can't control this person, so I'm going to sell that to, you know, Joe Smith next door because he's bigger, he's stronger, he's more willing to be brutal, he's whatever it is, I can sort of basically cash out. I can get my money out of the situation and leave the problematic issue of, of controlling this person to someone else. Despite his promise, Venture's new owner had no intention of ever granting him freedom. Because Venture had fought violently with whites on more than one occasion, his new owner quickly sold him again to an unsuspecting buyer from Connecticut. I left my wife and children. This was the third time of my being sold. To this place, I brought with me three old Spanish dollars, 2,000 of coppers, and five pounds of my wife's money, which I buried in the earth. I was then 31 years old. Venture Smith. plantation with 70 slaves on it is esteemed as good property. When a man marries off his daughter, he never talks of the fortune and money, but 20 or 30 or 40 slaves. Royal Governor William Tryon. On her wedding day, a woman in the colonies could expect to relinquish control of any property that she owned to her husband. <laughs> 
At the time of her second marriage, Martha Dandridge Custis was rumored to be the wealthiest widow in Virginia. Her intended was a military hero with a promising career in politics. The two had spent fewer than three weeks together in all of their lives. On a bitterly cold day in January of 1759, Martha Dandridge Custis and George Washington were wed. Washington was an up-and-coming member of the Virginia aristocracy. He was uh, not a terribly wealthy planter or aristocrat, but an individual who certainly had the potential for being uh, a wealthy uh, planter. So he'd made a name for himself, but he never had that kind of money that this marriage brought um, to him. The average planter owned two or three slaves and farmed 200 acres of tobacco. With his marriage to Martha Custis, Washington increased his slave holdings nine times over, adding 286 slaves to the 30 he already owned. In addition, he gained control of 17,000 acres of farmland, placing him among the 10 wealthiest planters in Virginia. It was a fortune he guarded closely. To clothe each adult slave, Washington spent less than a dollar a year. Children often went naked. In the fall of 1759, Washington's slaves harvested his first tobacco crop with great hopes he shipped the goods to England. But Washington soon received bad news. His tobacco could not command a decent price on the British market. Within two years, he was deeply in debt. He was not alone. There was a growing pattern of debt throughout the British Empire, and within 10 years, its effects would help turn American colonists against their king. In March of 1765, Parliament passed the Stamp Act. It was the first direct tax levied against the colonies. British politicians reasoned that Americans had grown prosperous under the king's protection. Now, it was time to pay the crown back. Colonists protested violently and refused to buy the government stamps. In New York, a howling mob attacked the British fort and forced the officer in charge to burn the stamped paper. In Boston, the stamp distributor was hanged in effigy. The houses of tax collectors were pillaged and destroyed. In Charleston, a city that was 60% black, white tradesmen took to the streets with a cry of liberty, liberty. Black men and women gathered publicly and began to shout liberty, liberty themselves. Frightened city officials called for armed patrols throughout the province. If you're a black resident in Charleston, seeing the Sons of Liberty march uh, down Broad Street with uh, flags that say Liberty, Liberty across them, and, uh, you can identify with that, you can relate to that, you can see that as an opening through which you can push your uh, desire for liberty as well. The year of the Stamp Act, Venture bought himself out of slavery. He paid his master 71 pounds and two shillings, the cost of roughly 4,000 acres of land. It was a rare achievement for a slave anywhere. In all of these narratives, Venture Smith's and other narratives that we have from this era and from later, the, the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual, the religious import of being free cannot be overstated. Being 36 years old, I left Colonel Smith once more for all. I had already been sold three different times had been cheated out of a large sum of money, lost much by misfortunes, and paid an enormous sum for my freedom. 
The coming of freedom was a moment so profound that the newly free often attributed their good fortune to divine intervention and committed their lives to Christ from that moment on. Emancipation was rebirth. Like many former slaves, Venture soon sought to free his family. He began his new life by cutting wood and hauling goods along the Connecticut River. They're hearing around them all the time ideas about freedom and liberty and equality because this is the revolutionary era in American life. So they, they are, they are, their own individual freedom begins to parallel this larger national rhetoric of freedom that leads to the establishment of the United States. So for people, particularly in New England, particularly in this era, they see their freedom as linked to the freedom of the nation. 28 years after being brought to American shores, Venture was free. But by law, free Negroes could not walk the streets or travel the waters after 9 p.m. without a pass. Connecticut's black codes prohibited free Negroes from inviting a slave or an Indian into their homes. In Boston, a free black person could not even carry a stick or a cane unless they could prove that it was needed for actual support of the body. And there was always the threat of being kidnapped and sold into slavery. Venture had paid 71 pounds for his freedom, but it would cost him much more to keep it. In the years following the Stamp Act, colonists resisted nearly every tax that the Crown imposed. In 1768, a British fleet dropped anchor in Boston Harbor. 4,000 troops came ashore to enforce English law. In March of 1770, occupying British troops shot and killed five men during a confrontation in the streets of Boston. The first to fall was a runaway slave named Crispus Attucks. A former dock worker who was known for not being afraid of a fight, Attucks was shot twice through the chest and died on the spot. Samuel Adams, a savvy pamphleteer, seized upon the killings to turn his fellow colonists against the crown. Throughout the colonies, March 5th, 1770, came to be known as the Boston Massacre. These men became instant martyrs in the revolutionary movement. These people were eulogized year after year on the anniversary, and the terms in which they were utilized became more and more um, sympathetic to them. Uh, these were um, noble men that came out. They were fathers and sons. Not one of them was married. They were all bachelors. They had no children. But all of the orphans that were left from them, uh, this became a cause celeb. I speak it with grief. I speak it with anguish. Britons are our oppressors. I speak it with shame. I speak it with indignation. We are slaves. Josiah Quincy, Boston, Massachusetts. Quite naturally, the real slaves are gonna pick up on this. And as a reaction to that, African Americans began to protest themselves and began to assess, as they have always done, a situation that might be an opportunity for liberty. There will be petition after petition to the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly and then later to the Continental Congress, petitions sent by African slaves themselves saying that we are demanding that you give us the same kind of freedom that you are demanding from England. The humble petition of many slaves living in the town of Boston is this. We Namely, expect that great things from men who have made such a noble stand against the designs of their fellow men to enslave them. We have no property. We, we have no city. 
no country. The divine spirit of freedom seems to fire every humane breast on the continent. In 1772, a British judge ruled that slavery was illegal on England's home soil. It was a decision that granted immediate freedom to more than 14,000 people. Though the ruling did not apply to the British colonies, it was a spark of hope for black Americans. Word of that court decision filters very quickly to North America. And we have runaway ads in the Virginia Gazette saying, my slave disappeared last week, heading for the coast, hoping to get on a ship to England where he can establish his freedom. That's how far word had spread. The following year, a London publisher released a book by a 20-year-old American poet named Phyllis Wheatley. She had been born in Africa and abducted into slavery during her childhood. She was purchased as a house servant by a Boston family who taught her to read and write while introducing her to the Bible. Phyllis learned English quickly and soon advanced to Latin and Greek. Her owners took great pride in her. They spoke of their Phyllis as if she were one of the family, and they invited the leading intellectuals of Boston to come and meet this most unusual slave. It can be very confusing, talking about human beings, you know, the humor, the acts of kindness that uh, we know slaves had for particular owners, and we know that particular owners had for groups of slaves. What's most important, however, is the big picture. Did ever any of those acts or instances of kindness change the thinking of a slave to make him or her accept their collective bondage and enslavement. Should you, my lord, while you pursue my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood? I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancy happy seat. What pain excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? Steeled was that soul and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such was my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway. The publication of her book made Wheatley a literary sensation, but it did not make her free. On the eve of the American Revolution, she was one of 500,000 slaves living in the colonies. The die is now cast. The colonies must either submit or triumph. I do not wish to come to severer measures, but we must not retreat. King George III to Lord North, September 1774. On April 19, 1775, a decade of tension between Crown and colonies erupted into full-scale warfare 20 miles from Boston. That day, nine black New Englanders fought alongside their white neighbors to stop an advancing column of British troops. In the town of Lexington, a small band of militiamen faced a hail of British bullets, leaving eight colonists dead. The news traveled quickly. At the town of Concord, Americans stopped the British advance. And on the road back to Boston, nearly 2,000 Americans ambushed the British soldiers. Hundreds were killed and wounded, and the American Revolution had begun. The colonists still looked upon themselves as colonists, as Englishmen who lived in America. So there was a great deal of, of attachment to one's particular province, and no real attachment at this point to a notion of a United States or even United colonies. In June of 1775, 
Colonial leaders named George Washington to command the army that was rapidly forming on the outskirts of Boston. As a Virginian, it was hoped that he would inspire Southerners to fight in a New England war. As a rich man, it was thought that his willingness to risk life and limb might serve as an example to others. Washington guessed that the conflict would be short, six months at the most. Colonial leaders wanted to secure their rights as Englishmen, but they had no intention of leaving the British Empire. We must assert our rights or submit to every imposition that shall make us tame and abject slaves as the blacks which we rule over with such arbitrary sway. George Washington. As Washington inspected his troops, he was surprised to find that slaves and free black men had mustered in among the white American soldiers outside of Boston. Within weeks after taking command, Washington ruled against recruiting slaves under any conditions. On the subject of free black soldiers, he was undecided. Washington was also a politician as well as a general, and he, he felt that the sight of uh, former slaves or of African Americans bearing arms might have an adverse effect in deep southern states. George Washington and his uh, council of war did not want blacks in the war, uh, perhaps because uh, it, would, it was felt that if they served in the war, that they would be entitled to their freedom uh, and that this would be a war uh, for the freedom of all people in the colonies. which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. I will assert that the same principle lives in us. God grant deliverance. Phyllis Wheatley. In October of 1775, George Washington ordered his recruiting officers to bar black Americans, slave or free, from further enlistment in the Continental Army. The Americans would have to find manpower elsewhere. Quietly, the British governor of Virginia put a plan in motion to strike fear in the hearts of American sympathizers. His strategy was to incite an enemy from within their midst. This enemy worked in their shops, lived in their homes, and put their children to bed. The British governor, Lord Dunmore, hints to his barber that he might free the slaves if it comes to that. He's leaking a rumor to send a message to white planters, but also to send a message to black slaves to test the water. Lo and behold, 24 hours later, there are half a dozen African Americans at the back door of the, I don't know if it's the back door or the front door. They show up at the mansion in Williamsburg uh, to say, we're ready, you know. If we can fight for our freedom, we'll, we'll do it if we can join. Within six months, in the fall of 1775, Dunmore actually issues a formal proclamation to that effect. And I hereby declare all indented servants and Negroes free that are able and willing to bear arms, joining His Majesty's troops as soon as may be, for speedily reducing the colony to a proper sense of their duty to His Majesty's crown. Lord Dunmore, Royal Governor of Virginia. <laughs> 
a liberation fever traveled throughout Virginia and beyond, black mothers named their newborn babies Dunmore. As far away as Philadelphia, a newspaper reported the story of a black man who refused to step off the sidewalk for a white woman shouting, wait till Lord Dunmore and his black regiment come. Slaves in the colonies, it seemed, would soon have their day. Hell itself could not have vomited anything more black than his design of emancipating our slaves. We know not how far the contagion may spread. The flame runs like wildfire through the slaves. I know not where these troubles may lead us. The Morning Chronicle, 1776. In New York, angry farmers on Long Island burned Dunmore in effigy and worried about slaves being too fond of British troops. In the face of Dunmore's proclamation, Southerners who had been loyal to the Crown became American patriots overnight. The Virginia Cassette urged slaves to cling to their kind masters, citing the fact that Dunmore himself was a slaveholder. Obviously, Dunmore's proclamation raises the ante for everybody. It, it creates the possibility of a serious slave uh, uprising for freedom. Hundreds of slaves left their masters to join the British ranks. Those who reached Dunmore were made royal soldiers in what he called his Ethiopian regiment. They were given guns and uniforms that were inscribed with the motto, Liberty to Slaves. If that man is not crushed before spring, he will become the most formidable enemy America has. His strength will increase as a snowball by rolling, and faster. If some expedient cannot be hit upon to convince the slaves and servants of the impotency of his designs. George Washington. Across the colonies, restrictions were tightened on meetings of servants, slaves, and free blacks. To discourage what one South Carolina official described as high notions of liberty, blacks were subjected to curfews and beatings. Some were murdered to serve as public examples. Yet, accounts circulated of slaves stealing their master's horses and riding to late night meetings. Still, others stole weapons and food, destroyed tools, and ran off to live among the Indians. African Americans don't sit idly by while the whites are murdering and doing all kinds of things to curtail their freedom. They know that the colonies are in turmoil and that the situation of enslavement is somewhat insecure. With the onset of war, thousands of black Americans sought to loosen the chains that bound them. When the American war was coming on, the ministers were not allowed to come amongst us lest they should furnish us with too much knowledge. I used to go to the little white children to teach me ABC. The reading ran in my mind that I think I learned in my sleep as readily as when I was awake. I can now read the Bible, so what I have in my heart, I can see again in the scriptures. I went to the swamp and poured my heart out before the Lord. I then came back to Brother Leal and told him my case. It gave me great relief, and I went home with a desire for nothing else but to talk to the brothers and sisters about the Lord. David George. By 1775, David George was preaching in Silver Bluff, South Carolina. Despite laws against assembly, Christian conversion was beginning to take hold in the lives of enslaved women and men as never before. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. <laughs> 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In little over 10 years time, black Christians in Savannah, Georgia, would establish the first African Baptist church, a place of their own to meet and worship. It was the first black Baptist church in America. Many among them were the daughters and sons of those who had come from Africa. Most of their parents had rejected Christianity, but they would choose differently. They can relate to Daniel in the lion's den. They can relate to Moses and this crossing the river into a promised land because in their own experience of life, they are in a wilderness and in this bondage and, and, and life, liberty, um, joy are, are within reach. It's not impossible and that's why they have hope because this life is just beyond the river. It's right there, we can get there. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, 25th verse. On April 6th, 1776, the Continental Congress called for a wartime halt to the slave trade. Their motives were largely economic, but the political implications were clear. If this were to be a war for the rights of man, the slave trade should play no part. I wish most sincerely there was not a slave in the province. It has always seemed to me a most iniquitous scheme to fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we. Abigail Adams. The events of a decade had caused a number of white Americans to speak out against oppression of any kind. As colonists dug in to fight their war for liberty, moral indignation against slavery soared. Lush, ye trifling patriots, ye pretended votaries for freedom. For while you are fasting and praying, non-importing, non-exporting, resolving and pleading for your rights, you are continuing this lawless, cruel, inhuman, and abominable practice of enslaving your fellow creatures. John Allen, preacher. In the words of one colonist, the conflict with England had set people a-thinking in six months more than they had done in their whole lives before. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve On July 4th of 1776, the colonies published a formal declaration of their independence from Britain. In it, they railed against George III and the English monarchy. They stated a belief that government should represent the people and not a king. Their reasoning was forceful and eloquent, and at the heart of their argument lay the assertion that all men are created equal. And in just a few words, it captures the essence inalienable rights, rights not given to you by the state, but given to you by God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, don't try to, you don't have to prove them. It's self-evident. Why is it self-evident? It came from God. They're inalienable. Government secures them. Remarkable document, but didn't apply to black folks. The principal author was a 33-year-old Virginian named Thomas Jefferson. He was a wealthy aristocrat who possessed a tireless intellect. As a student of politics, Jefferson sought to define a distinctly American view of freedom. He borrowed from ancient Greek democracy, Roman republicanism, and English doctrines of individual rights. 
to shape what would become this new American ideal. Yet at the time he wrote the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson held title to 202 human beings as his own personal property. While he wrote the very words, all men are created equal, a slave named Bob Hemings waited nearby to attend to Jefferson's every need. Thomas Jefferson kept slaves. But Thomas Jefferson nevertheless wrote those marvelous words and he understood the, the, the inconsistency of this all because he also wrote sometime later to a friend, if there is a just God, we're gonna pay for this. With his pen, Jefferson helped create the intellectual foundation of American liberty. Through his slave dealings, he would violate those principles almost every day of his life. Many people would write Jefferson during his lifetime asking him what he meant by all men are created equal. And I don't think he ever gave a very satisfactory uh, explanation to it. But what really mattered, I think, was what other people thought. From what authority do our masters assume the power to dispose of our lives? Freedom is the inherent right of the human species. We feel the dignity of human nature. We feel the passions and desires of other men. Give us an opportunity of evincing to the world our love of freedom by exerting ourselves in the cause of the country in which we ourselves have been so injuriously oppressed. For the sake of injured liberty, for the sake of justice and the rights of mankind, may the name of slave be heard no more in a land gloriously contending for the sweets of freedom. Signed, Natives of Africa, now detained in slavery. It's almost as if the first principles of the Declaration of Independence were not only natural rights, but they were like natural resources. They were like precious ore. They were like, they were like clean air you could breathe. And now they were written up in a formal document that said these belong to all men, that they're inalienable. They belong to everybody. George Washington learned of the Declaration on July 9, 1776. He assembled his troops on an open parade ground to hear the document read aloud. His hope was that the notion of independence would inspire his men to fight on. Within a year and a half, hundreds of those men would desert him. The pay was low, infectious disease was rampant, and a large number of poor whites still did not see this conflict as their revolution. At the end of 1777, George Washington went to his winter camp at Valley Forge with 23,000 men. By March, only 18,000 remained. In early 1778, a reluctant but desperate Washington endorsed a plan to raise a regiment of free blacks and slaves in Rhode Island. Congress approved, for slaves' freedom was the prize. Across the former colony, slaves would come ready to bear arms in exchange for their freedom. Many changed their names to reflect their aspirations. Pomp Liberty, Dick Freedom, Jupiter Free, Jeffrey Liberty. In all, some 5,000 black soldiers would serve alongside whites in America's army and navy. For a slave, to suddenly be promised freedom, freedom. You would be given a uniform, you would be given rations, you would be reasonably well fed and well cared for, and you would be part of something greater than a plantation existence. You were part of a national effort. And so it was, it was uplifting in so many ways. It took you out of this horrible situation you were in. It put you at a div different level of abstraction. It gave you a purpose in life. You're serving something. That something was a nation that might not be serving you in the proper way, but nevertheless, you can make a contribution to the future. My wife and children were yet in bondage to Mr. Thomas Stanton. I pursued various methods to redeem my family. In four years, I cut several thousand cords of wood, I raised watermelons, 
and perform many other singular labors. Venture Smith. In the years after his emancipation, Venture and Meg Smith pooled any money they could earn towards the freedom of their children. I shunned all kinds of luxuries. I bought nothing that I absolutely did not want. At 40 years of age, I purchased Solomon and Cuff, two sons of mine, for $200 each. The rest of my money I laid out in land. At a time when a free black person could expect little protection under the law, Venture sought to undergird his freedom with land and laborers. Here in Connecticut, he built the foundation for his family's home. But before he freed his wife, before he freed his daughter, Venture entered into a bargain with the first of several slaves. I bought a Negro man for no other reason than to oblige him and gave 60 pounds for him. But a short time after, he ran away from me, and I lost all that I gave for him except for the 20 pounds he paid me previous to his absconding. Venture Smith. In seeking to acquire uh, more labor, he purchases slaves. Uh, he attests to treating them very well, and then also attests to surprise uh, when they get up and, and leave him seeking their own freedom. Feeling cheated and betrayed, Venture turned to his sons. Solomon, my eldest son, and all my hope and dependence for help. I hired him out to one Charles Church of Rhode Island for one year. Church induced my son to go on a whaling voyage. As soon as I heard of his going to sea, I immediately set out to prevent it. But on my arrival, to my great grief, the vessel was out of sight. My son died of scurvy in this voyage. Besides the loss of his life, I lost equal to 75 pounds as Church has never yet paid me his wages. Venture Smith. With the death of Solomon, Venture worked to free his wife. I purchased my wife and thereby prevented having another child to buy as she was then pregnant. I gave 40 pounds for her. Soon after her emancipation, Meg Smith gave birth to their fourth child, a boy. This baby marked a new beginning for Venture and Meg. This baby was free. In a gesture of remembrance, they named him Solomon after the son they had lost at sea. In 1778, France signed a formal treaty of alliance with the Americans. By the end of that year, the British High Command knew that if they were to win the war, they would have to invade the South. They began in Georgia and moved up the coast to Charleston, South Carolina. Thousands of slaves joined them. The situation was essentially upheaval. The whites were fleeing their plantations as the British began to move into the South, sometimes trying to take their bond people with them, other times just leaving them. When they left them, many of the African Americans took over the plantation homes, looted them, took all kinds of clothing. So there was a tremendous amount of elation there was also the question of where were they going? How is it is it going to Those who ran into the woods risked everything. Capture by the Americans meant certain punishment, even death. And the way to the British was not clear. But they gathered their children, their parents, and their courage. It was a chance at a new life. I determined to go to Charlestown and throw myself into the hands of the English, 
they received me readily, and I began to feel the happiness of liberty, of which I knew nothing before, although I was most grieved to be obliged to leave my friends and remain among strangers. Boston King, Charlestown, South Carolina. A modern conception of war does not begin to understand what was happening in this war with this large train of Africans of all different descriptions in all kinds of transportation following the British. The idea that the British are a safe haven is in and of itself problematic. The British are deeply implicated in the slave trade, uh, the uh, slavery at the time of the revolution, slavery is still legal in the British colonies. So the idea that you, one would be safer being with the British than being with the Americans is not necessarily clear. While serving with the British, thousands of fugitive slaves contracted smallpox. British policy was that the sick be taken away from camp where untold numbers perished. Nevertheless, in South Carolina, more than 20,000 people risked life and limb to reach the British lines. In the spring of 1781, a small British fleet made its way up the Potomac River and dropped anchor in the waters off George Washington's estate. The soldiers departed with food, supplies, 18 Mount Vernon slaves, and the knowledge that the commander of the Continental Army could not protect his own house. The British Army had wreaked havoc in the South, but their string of victories was coming to an end. For most of the war, George Washington and his generals had waited for the moment when a major offensive might cripple the British Army and change American fortunes for good. That moment came in the fall of 1781 at a small Virginia tobacco port, Yorktown. October 16, 1781. Today there was stupendous cannonading on both sides. During these 24 hours, 3,600 shots were counted from the enemy, which they fired at the town, our line, and the ships in the harbor. The bombs hit many inhabitants and Negroes of the city. One saw men lying nearly everywhere whose heads, arms, and legs had been shot off. Johann Conrad Duda, soldier with the British forces, Yorktown, Virginia. At Yorktown, the Americans were joined by a French naval fleet from the West Indies and several detachments from the French army. For days, warships bombarded the British Army with constant cannon fire. As food and medical supplies began to run low in the British ranks, hundreds of black refugees were driven from their camp. Half-starved men and women hid in the woods, caught between the winning and losing armies. We had used them to good advantage and set them free. And now, with fear and trembling, they had to face the reward of their cruel masters. Johann Ewald, soldier with the British forces, Yorktown, Virginia. On October 17, 1781, 22 days after the siege at Yorktown had begun, Cornwallis, the British commander, surrendered. The same day, the Americans placed guards all along the beach to prevent fugitive slaves from escaping with the British. Many Negroes and mulattoes have concealed themselves on board the ships in the harbor. Others have attempted to impose themselves as free men to make their escapes. In order to prevent their succeeding, such Negroes are to be delivered to the guards which will be established for their reception. General George Washington. The defeat at Yorktown broke the back of the British resolve. Seven years of war had grown costly and lost support in London. For English generals and politicians alike, time was running out. For more than a year, as the British retreated across the South, 
Escaped slaves followed the ground forces and crowded into seaports. There, they fought to gain passage on ships bound for the British headquarters in New York City. Peace was restored between America and Great Britain, which diffused universal joy among all parties except us. A report prevailed that all the slaves, 2,000 in number, were to be delivered up to their masters. This dreadful rumor filled us with inexpressible anguish and terror. We saw our old masters coming from Virginia, North Carolina, and other parts, and seizing upon their former slaves in the streets of New York, or even dragging them out of their beds. For days, we lost our appetite for food, and sleep departed from our eyes. Boston King, fugitive slave, Imagine the situation you have in New York City at the end of the American Revolution. Thousands of African Americans who have made their choice to join the British, have watched the British fail to win the war, have realized they've bet on the wrong side, and find themselves huddled with these defeated British forces in Manhattan. Uh, the British are about to depart. They're going to take many of these people with them. Who's going to go? Who's going to stay? In eight years' time, as many as 100,000 slaves had escaped bondage. In New York, English officials compiled a book of Negroes, an inventory of every woman, man, and child in the city who could prove the length of their time with the British. 3,000 names are recorded in all. 6,000 former slaves boarded British ships in Charleston. Another 4,000 gained passage at the port of Savannah. Thousands went to Spanish Florida. Others sailed to the West Indies. The women and men who left from New York elected to settle in Nova Scotia, where they were promised freedom and a farm by British officials. It was not to be. Within four years, people were starving. Many thousands of African Americans who aided the British lost their freedom anyway. Many of them ended up in slavery in the Caribbean. Others, when they attempted to leave with the British in places like Charleston and Savannah, were prevented. And there are uh, uh, incredible letters written by Southerners of Africans after the siege of Charleston, swimming out to boats and the British hacking away at their arms with cutlasses to keep them from following them. So it was a very tragic situation. And of the many thousands of Africans who left the plantations, not many of them actually got their freedom. I am a poor Negro who with myself and my children have had the good fortune to get my freedom. I am told that they are going to pass a law to send us all back to our masters. This would be the cruelest act. To make a law to hang us would be merciful. Cato, a former slave. The years following the war were times of unrest and uncertainty. Slave owners in the Deep South sought to recover wartime losses by importing African slaves at an ever-increasing rate. Angry war veterans protested in public for moratoriums on their debts and equal distribution of the land. Individual states took up arms against each other in border disputes and there was constant speculation about splitting the new nation up into 13 separate countries. In 1787, representatives from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for a constitutional convention. They were there to restore order to a nation in turmoil. George Washington was summoned from his Virginia plantation to preside over the convention. By the end of the revolution, Washington is the revolution to a lot of people. He has an enormous amount of 
um, pride in the revolution and knows that it is far from being complete, knows from his study of history that very easily this could, a counter-revolution could take place and they would lose all they had fought for. There was no greater division in the nation than the one that lay between the states that had begun to abolish slavery and those that had not. In 1780, Pennsylvania lawmakers ruled that in keeping with the revolution's principles of equality, they would extend their freedom to others. As a result, all black children born in Pennsylvania from that year forward were to be freed at age 28. In 1783, Massachusetts outlawed slavery entirely based on a state constitution that declared all men are born free and equal. Connecticut and Rhode Island soon followed with gradual emancipation acts. As the tide began to turn against slaveholders in the North, the nation's founders laid the groundwork for a society that could grow while both espousing ideals of liberty and endorsing the practice of slavery. Every time a new state was brought into the Union, the test was, was there a slave state to bring in with a free state? So we've got a nation now growing with the interest of free states and the slave states kind of trying to grow in tandem. It's a dispute between two different systems. One system of slavery, based upon slavery, and the other system based upon free labor. And so virtually every issue that was discussed in the Constitutional Convention had an impact from slavery. Delegates voiced great concern over the protection of individual liberties and personal property. For Southern delegates, one of the most important liberties was the right to own slaves. While they wanted a federal government that would protect their rights, they did not want a governing body that would emancipate their slaves. The problem with the libertarian ideology of the entire revolutionary and constitutional period is this notion that uh, the pursuit of happiness is tied to property. So even though Thomas Jefferson is able to say all men are created equal and endowed by their created with inalienable rights, these rights include the right of property. Uh, as strongly as people might adhere to the notion of liberty and freedom, they adhere just as strongly to the notion of property. In the course of six months, the 55 delegates drafted the foundation of American law and government. Neither the word slave nor slavery appear in the Constitution, but the fate of enslaved men, women, and children was carefully inscribed within its pages. The U.S. Constitution prevented Congress from voting to end the African slave trade for a minimum of 20 years. Free states were required by law to return fugitives to the slave states, and slave states were permitted to count three-fifths of their slave population in determining the number of representatives they would send to Congress. Slaveholders won an enormous political victory. Owning slaves would be part of the American freedom, and in the process, a union was forged. The federal constitution was ratified in 1788. The following year, George Washington was sworn in as the nation's first president. During the course of his two administrations, Washington, like a growing number of Americans, began to feel that slavery was evil and an unsound economic system for the future. Yet he kept his thoughts confined to private correspondence with close friends and never took a public stand against slavery. During his presidency, he and his wife owned 317 human beings. Upon the decease of my wife, it is my will and desire 
that all the slaves which I hold in my own right shall receive their freedom. In his final will, George Washington stipulated that upon his wife's death, the 125 slaves that he owned outright would be free. His wife's slaves would be parceled out to her heirs according to the terms of her will. He had sought to reconcile in death what he could not come to terms with in life. On a cold December night in 1799, George Washington died. <sighs> Following her husband's death, Martha Washington moved out of the bedroom she had shared with him and took up residence in a small guest room. Her last years were troubled filled with melancholy, loneliness, and a growing fear of the slaves who lived at Mount Vernon. There were 125 people who knew that when she died, they were free. She feared for her life. And so Martha actually went to court in Fairfax County and freed those slaves um, a year after her husband died. She did not wait, and so she was clearly uncomfortable. And you, you must think that Washington thought that, that she might be in that situation, and I think he didn't want to put her in harm's way, but he just didn't know what else to do. I am bowed down with age and hardship. While I am now looking to the grave as my home, I have many consolations. Meg, the wife of my youth, whom I married for love, is still alive. I am now possessed of more than 100 acres of land and three houses, but my freedom is a privilege which nothing else can equal. Venture Smith. Venture Smith died in 1805 as the practice of slavery began its slow demise in the part of the country that he called home. The census of 1800 recorded the presence of over 100,000 free black people living in the United States. By contrast, there were 800,000 slaves. America had won its war, but for black Americans, the revolution would remain a fight unfinished. They came from different lands, all facing an uncertain future. English and Ashanti, Mendi and Portuguese, German and Igbo, Fanti and Spaniard, French and Angolan, some seeking adventure or riches or religious freedom. Others were captives, bartered and sold like cattle. Together they would build a nation and struggle over the very meaning of freedom and create the America we have inherited today. I don't think you can understand race relations today without understanding slavery. Even though people will say, I didn't do it, my father didn't do it, even my grandparents, they didn't do it. One of the things that's essential is to know that slavery is not just a Southern institution, it's an American institution. What evolves in North America is the belief system where to be black meant to be a slave and to be a slave meant to be black. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Why is it self-evident? It came from God. They're inalienable. Government secures them. Remarkable document. It didn't apply to black folks. And the man who wrote them, those words 
Thomas Jefferson kept slaves. He also wrote sometime later to a friend, if there is a just God, we're going to pay for this. Slavery and freedom existed side by side in this country. I think the issue is, did it always have to be that way? And the early history of America indicates that it probably did not. in the colony that was called Virginia, in the county of Northampton. After a season of disputes, a white man and a black man went into the field and there divided their crop and their land. According to the testimony given in court, the man named Anthony the Negro said, Mr. Taylor and I have divided our corn and I am very glad of it, for now I know mine own ground. In April 1607, three vessels carrying 105 colonists landed at a place they named Jamestown, at the edge of the Virginia wilderness. They hoped to establish the first permanent English settlement in the New World. There, Englishmen would build a new promised land, the brave new world that their poet Shakespeare dreamed, a free land built by free men. The dreams were utopian initially. Colonies without coercion, without oppression, where each man would be regarded as free and equal. There was a lot of idealism, I think, in the, uh, in, among, in the early settlements in, uh, in the New World. Uh, a lot of idealism, which I think didn't didn't stand much to the test of uh, of of experience. Englishmen believed that their God had ordained them to spread His word, and that they had the God-given right to drive out all unwilling to live according to English law. But in the first two years. The colonists learned that they were unprepared for life in the American wilderness. The fourth day of September died Thomas Jacob Sargent. The fifth day there died Benjamin Beast. Our men were destroyed with cruel diseases of swellings, flixes, burning fevers and by wars, and some departed suddenly but for the most part, they died of mere famine. There were never Englishmen left in a foreign country in such misery as we were in this new discovered Virginia. George Percy. In 1609, 500 settlers lived in the Jamestown colony. By the spring of 1610, only 60 were left alive. 
Towards the latter end of August, a Dutch man of war arrived at Point Comfort. The commander's name, Captain Jope. He brought not anything but 20 and odd Negroes, which the governor bought in exchange for food. John Rolfe, Virginia colonist, In 1619, a year before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, a mystery ship appeared out of a violent storm off the Virginia coast. No one recorded the ship's name, but somewhere on the high seas, she had robbed a Spanish vessel of a cargo of Africans. In search of supplies, she traded the Africans for food. They had been baptized and given Christian names. As Christians, they could not be enslaved for life under English law. Like most Europeans in the colony, they were purchased to work as servants for a limited number of years. The new arrival supplied much needed labor for the tobacco crop that was making men rich. Settlers were planting tobacco in the streets of Jamestown, carving plantations out of the surrounding wilderness, and shipping some 60,000 pounds a year back to England. Once tobacco is established as a viable commodity, then the more land you control, the bigger profits you can make. And in order to make those profits, you need more labor, and you look for that labor wherever you can find it. Well, the colony builders uh, initially intended to rely almost exclusively on white indentured servants as a labor force to cultivate the crops that were being grown in Virginia, principally tobacco. And in order to create these raw materials of goods, you often needed labor. The world the Africans entered was controlled by wealthy Englishmen and populated by the English poor, most under the age of 25. In return for passage to Virginia, they had traded four to seven years of their labor. They were bound to a master by an indenture form, a contract that defined length of service and the conditions of servitude. Most were promised freedom dues after their service, a bushel of corn, a new suit of clothes, and 100 acres of land. Under Virginia's head right system, a planter was entitled to 50 acres of land for each servant brought into the colony. The issue always was how long that indenture would be and, and under what conditions you would be forced to work. At its best, it was a short, friendly apprenticeship. You know, at its worst, it was a it was a long and exploitative situation in which you might die before you ever obtained your freedom. By 1622, 3,000 new settlers, drawn by the opportunities of the tobacco boom, had arrived in Virginia. Two years later, the first Negro child was born in the colony. He was named. William Tucker, after a Virginia planter. The prosperity that began in 1619 and the dream of a new Eden, of people peacefully coexisting under English law, was seriously threatened in March 1622. On Good Friday, some 30 nations of the Powhatan Confederacy, angered by English violation of land treaties, attacked without warning and attempted to drive the English back into the sea. Along the James River, the Indians killed 350 colonists. On the Bennett Plantation alone, 52 people died. Among the 12 who survived was a man named Antonio. <laughs> 
Here's an individual that arrives as one of the first African Americans in the history of what became the United States. He does what almost no one in early Virginia managed to do, and that is live. Everyone that's dying of disease, of violence, and since he's lucky. He had been brought to the colony the year before to work tobacco along the James River. His name appeared in the 1625 Virginia census as Antonio a Negro. He was listed as a servant. He comes to Virginia, finds a society that is just developing. He's getting in on the ground floor, as it, as it were. Um, I don't know if he was able to immediately envision that there would be opportunities for him here that uh, weren't available elsewhere. I don't know that anyone could have foretold that. When Antonio arrived, the laws of Virginia did not as yet define racial slavery. They governed only the status of servants. At some point, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson and married a Negro servant named Mary from a neighboring plantation. She bore him four children. By 1640, it is clear Anthony and Mary were no longer servants. They had acquired their own modest estate on Virginia's eastern shore. As Johnson prospered, as he obtained land and cattle, he also acquired dependent laborers. What made all of this society go was property. Your identity in the society was determined rather obviously by the amount of land, the amount of labor that you owned. Anthony Johnson was enjoying privileges belonging to a free Englishman. He claimed five workers as headwrights and expanded his property to 250 acres along the Pongateague Creek. At least some of his workers were white. By 1650, Anthony was one of 400 black people in Virginia out of a population of almost 19,000 settlers. In Northampton County, where Johnson lived, Nearly 20 African men and women were free, and 13 owned their own homes. As Anthony Johnson is accumulating property, it seems as though his situation is secure. You get a sense of this individual, this black man, being treated like any white planter, and his wife and daughters being treated like the wife of a planter. At an early moment, when men and women were sorting themselves out, when the rules, the etiquette of race, labor, were not so clear. At this moment, in one county in Virginia, it was not foreordained that race relations would become what they did become. In 1640, the year Anthony Johnson purchased his first piece of land, three servants had run away from a Virginia plantation and headed for Maryland. Captured and returned to their owner, they were tried for breaking their contract. The said three servants shall receive the punishment of whipping and to have 30 stripes apiece. One called Victor, a Dutchman, the other a Scotchman called James Gregory, shall first serve out their times according to their indentures, and one whole year apiece after, and after that to serve the colony for three whole years apiece. The third, being a Negro named John Punch, shall serve his said master or his assigns for the time of his natural life. Jamestown Court Recorder. The time of his natural life. According to all the legal records that survive, no white servant in America ever received such a sentence. So what begins to happen in the 1640s is that those who are controlling the Virginia colony say to themselves, the fluidity that we've seen in the past, the fluidity that has allowed an Anthony Johnson to serve less than a life term, to acquire his own piece of ground, to develop a free status, 
is not something that we want to project as going further in the future. We want to close down that opportunity. We want to begin to show some distinctions. The English definition of who could be enslaved began to shift from non-Christian to non-white. For Anthony and other Africans in America, the idea of an equal chance in the colonies was now under attack. In 1641, Massachusetts became the first colony on the British American mainland to recognize slavery as a legal institution. Connecticut followed in 1650, Maryland in 1663, New York and New Jersey in 1664. Virginia legally recognized slavery in 1661, and a year later, a Virginia court decided that all children born in the colony would be free or slave according to the condition of the mother. In Virginia, slavery would be defined by race and perpetuated through heredity. Perhaps in the middle of the 17th century, if you were one of several thousand Africans living in Virginia, uh, you certainly knew that your children would would uh, be free, you might have that expectation. And to suddenly find themselves involved in lifelong servitude and then to realize that in fact their children might inherit the same status, that was a terrible blow. That was a terrible transformation. I looked in the east I looked in the west. I For the first 50 years of the colony, most of the unfree labor force had been European, but that was about to change. Word of the hard life in Virginia had gotten back to England, and the colonial government faced a growing shortage of servant labor. Also troubling the colony were the thousands of free men, most former indentured servants, who were unemployed and roaming the countryside. The problem they face is not only a decreasing supply of indentured servants, but they face this increasing problem of what to do with all these indentured servants once they live out their term. And a lot of them were surviving. They had to be given land. They had to be given their freedom dues. And one of those dues included even guns. And there was a lot of unrest in Virginia. In 1661, servants rebelled in York County. Two years later, Gloucester County authorities foiled a plot by nine servants to steal arms and ammunition and march on the seat of colonial government. In 1676, the unrest in Virginia exploded into civil war. An army of 500, free men, servants, and slaves rebelled against the colonial establishment's restriction on available lands. They attacked peaceful Indians, ransacked property, and burned Jamestown, sending the governor into hiding. This disorder that the indentured servant system had created made racial slavery to southern slaveholders much more attractive because what, what were black slaves now? Well, they were a permanent, dependent, labor force who could be could be defined as a people set apart they were racially set apart they were outsiders they were strangers and in many ways throughout the, the, the world with with a couple possible exceptions slavery has taken root especially well when the people who are enslaved are defined as strangers as outsiders and can therefore be put into an inheritable permanent status of slavery I understand there are some slave ships expected into York River now every day. I desire you to buy me five or six slaves, whereof three or four to be boys, a man, and a woman. The boys from eight to seventeen or eighteen, the rest as young as you can procure them. William Fitzhugh, Virginia Planter, 1681. 
few ships coming from Africa made the voyage beyond the Caribbean to sell their cargoes on the mainland of British America. In 1672, the King of England chartered the Royal African Company, encouraging it to expand the British slave trade. Shareholders included 15 English lords and 25 sheriffs, the governor of Virginia, and John Locke, the philosopher of liberty. In its first 16 years, the company transported nearly 90,000 Africans to the Americas. In the last decade of the 17th century, it was possible to imagine that in a single year, the number of new Africans arriving would equal the total black population in the colony or close to it. These were men and women that had no sense of the world they were getting into, and they seemed to whites as very alien, foreign, unknowable. The Europeans look upon these people and they project an image on them. They project an identity, and that identity is African. What that means is non-American. What that means is non-European. What that means is separation. All servants imported and brought into this country who are not Christian in their native land shall be counted and be slaves. If any slave resists his master correcting such slave and shall happen to be killed in such, it shall not be accounted felony. If any Negro shall absent himself from his master's service and lie hid and lurking, and if he shall resist any person employed to apprehend the said Negro, then it shall be lawful for such person to kill the said Negro. Virginia General Assembly, June 1680. We think about slavery as this complete package. It just came to evil landowners, and it didn't happen that way. It happened one law at a time, one person at a time. And as landowners felt the need to control a different behavior, year after year, they added more laws until finally, 1691, they passed the law that made it illegal to free a black slave unless they were leaving the colony. So by then, it was pretty much set that this was going to be a slave society. To move from indentured servitude to racial slavery means that they're setting their own history on a course where freedom is going to depend on slavery, where the political economy of a major portion of these colonies is going to depend on slavery, uh, where the freedom of some is going to depend on the bondage of others. It means that the American colonies, this jewel of the British Empire, is living this contradictory history now of a society that is increasingly rooted in a labor system that's human bondage, that's racial slavery. Johnson moved his family out of Virginia and north to Maryland. There he leased 300 acres he called Tony's Vineyard. On that farm, Anthony Johnson died. Back in Virginia, a jury decided that the land Anthony had left behind could be seized by the state because he was a Negro and by consequence an alien. One wonders how Johnson would have viewed this changing world of Virginia. He lived a very long time. He survived and did quite well by the standards of the day, building up properties, hundreds, hundreds of acres, and cattle. By the standards of the time, anyone would say he did quite well. There's no reason to believe, uh, as of, say, the 1670s, that the Johnson family is going to be squeezed out Within a few years, 
Anthony's grandson, John, purchased another 44 acres and in memory of his grandfather's homeland, called the farm, Angola. By the time the end of the century came, Anthony Johnson's children and grandchildren may well have been fighting to stay free. Many free people were sold into slavery. No, they couldn't prove that they were free. They, they had no way of letting anybody know that they were free. So if a plantation owner came by and said, this is my slave and I want to sell him, you were sold. By the end of the century, nearly 58,000 people lived in the colony. 16,000 were listed as Negroes. In 1705, the Virginia Assembly passed laws clearly defining the distinction between a slave and a servant, relegating all slaves to the status of real estate. The next year, John, the third generation of Johnsons in America, died without an heir. That would be the last mention of the plantation named for Anthony's birthplace. Angola Plantation, like the Johnsons themselves, disappeared from the record books of colonial America. The African trade is a trade of the most advantage to this kingdom of any we derive. And as it will all profit, it is indeed the best traffic the kingdom hath, as it doth occasionally give so vast an employment to our people, both by sea and land. John Carey, Bristol, England. In 1698, the English Parliament ended the monopoly of the Royal African Company on the African slave trade. It became the right of every freeborn British subject to trade in slaves. Over the next half century, the number of Africans transported to the British colonies in British ships increased from 5,000 to 45,000 a year. England became the largest trafficker in slaves in the Western world. It is the first principle and foundation of all the rest, said one British writer, the mainspring of the machine which sets every wheel in motion. He was born Ibo, the son of a tribal elder, the favorite of his mother. He died an Englishman, the father of two daughters, and the husband of an English woman. At the age of 11, Olauda Equiano was kidnapped by Africans and sold to Europeans. When the grown people were gone far in the fields to labor, the children generally assembled together to play. And some of us often used to get up into a tree to look out for any assailant or kidnapper that might come upon us. One day, when only I and my sister were left to mind the house, two men and a woman got over our walls and in a moment seized us both without giving us time to cry out or to make any resistance, they stopped our mouths and ran off with us. Olauda Equiano. Obonye kaye nacho, obonye kaye nacho, ekwano kaye nacho, nzumalizo. <laughs> 
obonye ka anyi na acho obonye ka anyi na acho okwa no ka anyi na acho nzumalizo who are we looking for who are we looking for it's a kwano we are looking for nzumalizo has he gone to the stream let him come back has he gone to the market let him come back has he gone to the farm let him return it's a kwano we are looking for nzumalizo For more than four centuries, people disappeared from the savannas, the rainforests, and the villages of Black Africa. Farmers and craftspeople, commoners and African nobility. Most were strong young men, age 15 to 25. But women and children were also taken and sold. To obtain slaves, Africans waged war, destroying communities, stealing people. To escape the spreading violence, many moved into the interior, abandoning family compounds, farms, entire villages. In West Africa, more than 20 million people were kidnapped into slavery. Only half would survive the journey to the coast. The boy Equiano was one of the survivors. At last, I came to the banks of a large river. I was beyond measure, surprised at this as I had never before seen any water larger than a pond or rivulet. And my surprise was mingled with no small fear when I was put into one of these canoes and we began to paddle and move along the river. On the journey to the coast, Equiano passed from one African master to another. Once he was sold for 172 cowrie shells. He learned three different languages, traveled some 800 miles, and encountered people and customs unfamiliar and frightening to him. After close to seven months of travel on foot and by boat, he reached the African coast. The first object that saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship which was then riding at anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment that was soon converted into terror. It was an ancient business, this trade in human beings between Africa and Europe. Fifty years before Columbus sailed to the New World, Portuguese explorers had sailed to West Africa. At first seeking gold, they built a fort in 1482 and called it Elmina, the mine. The Portuguese pointed their guns toward the Atlantic to guard, not against Africans, but against European competitors. Over time, the castle changed hands from the Portuguese to the Dutch and finally the British. And the trade changed from gold to human beings. <laughs> 
concerning the trade on this coast. We notified your highness already that it has completely changed into a slave coast and that nowadays the natives no longer occupy themselves with the search for gold, but rather make war on each other in order to furnish slaves. The Gold Coast has changed into a complete slave coast. Willem de la Palma, director, Dutch West India Company. Along the west coast of Africa, from Senegal in the north to the Cameroons in the south, the Europeans built some 60 forts and castles, warehouses for European merchandise and for African slaves. Called factories, they were commercial centers where agents or factors traded rum, cloth, and guns for human beings and gold. The most notable item is the slave house, which lies below ground. It consists of vaulted cellars divided into several apartments which can easily hold a thousand slaves. Captain John Barbeau, French slave trader. In dungeons built deep into the ocean rock, people waited. Sometimes a day, sometimes a year. These chambers would be their last memory of Africa. When a slave ship arrived and anchored off the coast, they would be led out from the darkness to the beach. As the slaves come down to feed her from the inland country, they are put into a booth or prison near the beach. When the Europeans are to receive them, they are brought out into a large plain where the surgeons examine every one of them, all stark naked. Each which have passed as good is marked on the breast with a red-hot iron imprinting the mark of the French, English, or Dutch companies. In this Particular care is taken that the women, as tenderest, be not burnt too hard. Captain John Barbeau, French slave trader. The white people did not need to be present in the interior of Africa. All they needed to do was to supply the weapons. The people they dealt with were um, those coastal peoples right on the, on the, on the coastline who controlled the, the territory down there. So Kwano would not have met, maybe not even heard of white people. I have found no place where I can enlarge my fortune so soon as where I now live. In this manner, we spend the prime of youth among Negroes, scraping the world for money the universal god of mankind until death overtakes us. Nicholas Owen, slave trader. Europeans died like flies in that climate. The average expectation was three or four years, you know, really. And so they had to make money while they could because they knew they didn't have much time. So in that sense, of course, they were, they were trapped. They were caught in the web of the system and held there and died there. The Europeans made more than 54,000 voyages to trade in human beings. No one will ever know the exact number of people taken from the shores of West Africa, but more than 11 million have been counted in the records that remain. Most headed for South America and the Caribbean islands, some half a million to the mainland of North America. December 29th, 1724. No trade today, though many traders came on board. They informed us that the people are gone to war with inland. 
and will bring prisoners enough in two or three days, in hopes of which we stay. December 30th, 1724. No trade yet, but our traders came on board today and informed us the people had burnt four towns of their enemies, so that tomorrow we expect slaves. Liverpool surgeon. Received on this cargo 46 men, 34 women, 14 boys, six girls, and 147 chests of corn. The rest of the goods delivered on shore to Cape Coast and Accra to Mr. Harbin. William Dexter, ship's captain. Ship captains were cautioned not to buy all their slaves from one place. Africans who knew each other, who spoke the same language, were more likely to conspire and rebel. There would be maybe 25 seamen and the ship's officers. There might have been a crew of 30. And these 30 had to um, control maybe 300 men, black men and women, who were aware of being abducted and who were, in, who, were, who were desperate and who were dangerous because they were obviously waiting to seize any opportunity that was, was offered to, to rebel and to take over the ship and to kill, to kill the crew, and that, that did happen fairly frequently. The only way that this could be contained was by a system of fear. I was now persuaded that I had got into a world of bad spirits and that they were going to kill me. Their complexions, too, differing so much from ours. Their long hair and the language they spoke, which was very different from any I had ever heard, united to confirm me in this belief. I no longer doubted my fate. I asked if we were going to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces, and long hair. Olauda Equian. Captains call the voyage from West Africa to the New World, the Middle Passage, the middle leg of a triangular course that began and ended in Europe. From English ports, ships sailed to Africa to trade goods for slaves, then the human cargo was taken to the Americas and traded for raw materials, which were then carried back to England and sold. The crossing from Africa to the Americas usually took 60 to 90 days, but some voyages took as long as four or even six months. Bad weather and sickness could turn any trip into a nightmare. The cramped quarters of ships being packed in such a way that a slave will be between the legs of another slave and having to lie in the feces. The lack of air, the longer this trip takes, um, the more suffocating. The surgeon, upon going between decks in the morning to examine the situation of the slaves, frequently finds several dead, and sometimes a dead and living Negro fastened by their irons together. When this is the case, they are brought upon the deck. The living Negro is disengaged and the dead one thrown overboard. Alexander Falkenridge, ship's surgeon. There are no doubt people who went mad. Inability to communicate, decisions having to be made, and this person is suffering as yourself. Does one help? Does one simply try to make it the best that one can alone? Not knowing, where am I being taken? What is my fate? Um, for weeks, months, depending what the point of origin was. <laughs> 
of my weary countrymen who were chained together somehow made it through the nettings and jumped into the sea. Immediately, another quite dejected fellow also followed their example, and I believe many more would have very soon done the same if they had not been prevented by the ship's crew, who were instantly alarmed. Ulauda Equiano. The idea, I think, was that the slave cannot be allowed to die by his own will and intention. He cannot be allowed to die voluntarily. If he's going to die, it must be at the hands of his captors, so that in that case, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't spread a dangerous example. Monday, 11th December. By the favor of divine providence, made a timely discovery today that the slaves were forming a plot for insurrection. Surprised two of them attempting to get off their arms, and in their rooms found knives, stones, shot, etc., and a cold chisel. There appeared eight principally concerned in protecting the mischief, and four boys in supplying them with the above instruments. Put the boys in arms, and slightly in the thumb screws to urge them to a full confession. Captain John Newton. We stood in arms, firing on the revolted slaves, of whom we killed some and wounded many. And many of the most mutinous leapt overboard and drowned themselves in the ocean with much resolution. James Barbo, English sailor, 1701. Often did I think many of the inhabitants of the deep much happier than myself. Every circumstance I met with served only to render my state more painful and heighten my apprehensions and my opinion of the cruelty of whites. Olaudo Equiano. The slavers, they knew at one level that these were human beings because they were obviously clearly human beings. At the same time, they were objects of profit. And those two concepts could, couldn't obviously be really reconciled, and they never were reconciled. It was just, I think, that the, 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 the humane, the, the, the sense of the humanity of these people, were, it was simply suppressed for the sake of gold. And the shocking thing is that human beings are able indefinitely to suppress the, the urgings of their common humanity and to deny it for the sake of making profits is not the slave trade entirely a war with the heart of man and surely that which is begun by breaking down the barriers of virtue involves in its continuance destruction to every principle and buries all sentiment in ruin o lauda equiano The middle passage ended for Equiano on the island of Barbados, one of the most profitable colonies in the British Empire. On Barbados, it was calculated that it was cheaper to work slaves to death and replace them with new slaves than to treat them humanely. Within three years of arrival, one out of three slaves would die. The boy Equiano, judged too small to cut sugarcane, was shipped north to the mainland of British America. On the mainland, the plantation system of Barbados was admired and imitated, particularly on the Carolina coast. South Carolina started as the colony of the colony. Barbados had become overpopulated with the younger sons of English merchants and with their slaves. And in both cases, they began to look around, cast around for new places. And within the first decade after South Carolina's initial settlement, there were just loads of immigrants from Barbados uh, who brought 
with them uh, slaves from Barbados, but more important than just bringing slaves, unlike Virginia, they brought a fully conceived idea of slavery. On the shores of the Ashley River stands Middleton Place, home to one of Carolina's oldest families. Middleton family members were destined to become part of the Carolina elite. A governor, a congressman, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. The family had been among the first settlers arriving from Barbados in 1678 with a land grant in Goose Creek, just 14 miles north of Charleston, Carolina's slave trading center. By 1706, a second generation of Middletons had almost tripled the size of the family's land holdings to 5,000 acres of Carolina wilderness. At age 25, young Arthur Middleton was master of the Oaks Plantation. Dear Sarah, Mr. Arthur Middleton is married to my sister and was a schoolfellow with me when I was at Carolina. He is a sensible man and one of the richest in the country, with upwards of 100 Negroes. Thomas Amory. Racial slavery turns out to be extraordinarily profitable for the people who have seized control. The planter can complain in his diary that it's been a bad year or the crop is weak or the rainy season lasted too long, but year in and year out, tremendous profits are being made. The immigrants from Barbados had searched for a cash crop that would make them rich. Families like the Middletons found it. It was rice. The most prized Africans in Carolina were from Angola, Senegambia, and the Windward Coast, people who brought the rice-growing skills the Europeans did not have. Rice is the most unhealthy work in which the slaves were employed and they sank under it in great numbers. The causes of this dreadful mortality are the constant moisture and heat of the atmosphere, together with the alternate floodings and drying of the fields on which the Negroes are perpetually at work, often ankle-deep in mud, with their bare heads exposed to the fierce rays of the sun. Captain Basil Hall. Many masters can't be persuaded that Negroes and Indians are otherwise than beasts and use them like such. I daily perceive that many things are done here out of a worldly principle, little for God's sake. Francis Fajot, Anglican minister. In 1706, the Middletons donated four acres of land for a church in Goose Creek. Francis Lejeu, the first full-time Anglican minister, was not opposed to slavery, but he preached that all men, regardless of color, had immortal souls. He earned a reputation for spending time with the Negroes, baptizing and teaching them to read the Bible. He spoke out often against the brutality of Carolina slaveholders who were seeking to control the growing population of Africans. I have had of late an opportunity to oppose with all my might a very unhumane law in relation to runaway Negroes. Such a Negro must be mutilated by amputation of testicles if it be a man and an ear if a woman. I have openly declared against such a punishment grounded upon the law of God. Francis Lejeu. The Anglican missionaries probably described the black community better than anyone at the time in early Carolina. They described it as a nation within a nation. 
which the Africans lived separated from the rest of society. Being freshly from Africa, their frame of reference was African. They were very much familiar with this kind of subtropical environment that they found themselves in in Carolina. There are still communities of people who live, love, raise children, and work, and they feel that as people, as humans, they have a right to come and go. They have a right to visit their wives and their husbands on other plantations. It was, as one traveler said, a Negro country. Their numbers increase every day, as well by birth as importation. And in case there should arise a man of desperate courage, exasperated by a desperate fortune, he might kindle a servile war. Such a man might be dreadfully mischievous before any opposition could be formed against him and tinge our rivers as wide as they are with blood. William Byrd. Virginia Planter. In 1710, just 15 years after rice took hold in Carolina, Africans began to outnumber Europeans in the colony. As the number of Africans rose, so too did white fear and retaliation. Mr. D told me once he cut off a Negro man's leg for running away. I asked him if the man had died in the operation and how he, as a Christian, could answer for the horrid act before God. And he told me answering was a thing of another world. What he thought and did were policy. He then said his scheme had the desired effect. It cured that man and some others of running away. If you're a white authority, you're constantly trying to figure how tightly you want to impose the lid with respect to people running away. How fierce should the punishments be? You know, should it be a whipping? Should it be the loss of a finger or a hand or a foot? You know, should it be wearing uh, shackles perpetually? The entire system of control is based on physical punishment, often making examples out of people so that others will be intimidated. The colonial legislature passed laws designed to more tightly control the growing black majority. Planter records reveal punishments inflicted for infractions, large and small. 8th February, 1709. I rose at 5 o'clock this morning and read a chapter in Hebrew and 200 verses in Homer's Odyssey. I ate milk for breakfast. I said my prayers. Jenny and Eugene were whipped. 17 April. Annika was whipped yesterday for stealing the rum and filling the bottle up with water. I said my prayers and I danced my dance. Eugene was whipped again for pissing in bed and Jenny for concealing it. I took a walk about the plantation. Eugene was whipped for running away and had the bit put on him. I said my prayers. I had good health, good thoughts, and good humor. Thanks be to God Almighty. William Byrd. Virginia Planter. When you enslave a person, in some ways, you become a slave yourself because masters and slaves are natural enemies. And that's what the Europeans had to deal with. They had to deal with a population 
living amongst them, sometimes the majority of the population, in hostility. They lived amongst enemies. And as one Carolina planter said, nowhere on earth is mankind so plagued by enemies living within them as we are in our own homes. The Spanish are receiving and harboring all our runaway Negroes. They have found out a new way of sending our own slaves against us to rob and plunder us. We are not only at a vast expense in guarding our southern frontiers, but the inhabitants are continually alarmed. Arthur Middleton, acting governor, 1728. On the South Carolina frontier, word spread of Africans and Indians coming up from Spanish Florida to attack planters, and of Spanish authorities offering runaways freedom on Florida soil. In Goose Creek, an Anglican minister complained of secret poisonings and bloody insurrections by certain Christian slaves. South Carolina is a pot ready to boil over. Imagine coming into a, a setup that seems almost unbearable and finding that people have, have many of them have somehow rationalized it or, or are enduring it. You know, that's the best they can do. But you as a newcomer might feel, I'm not gonna put up with this. Better to die trying to change this. And there must have been hundreds of people like that in South Carolina in the 1730s. By the 1730s, close to 2,000 Africans were arriving at the port of Charleston each year. From 1735 to 1739, out of 11,000 slaves landed, more than 8,000 were listed as Angolans. What develops is a sense among Europeans that slaves from certain areas have particular characteristics. Slaves from the Angola area are reputed among the English to be particularly difficult, to be rebellious. In St. Paul's Parish, there were close to a thousand new people who just a few years before had been taken from the Angola region of Africa. One of them, we only know his name, a man named Jemmy, apparently had come recently from Angola. He may not even have spoken English, but he may have had strong contacts with other Angolans. He had to try to build alliances, not only with other Angolans, other new arrivals, but with other Africans, African Americans, uh, people from, from a community that he was not that familiar with. And apparently he succeeded. During the early morning hours of September 9th, 1739, almost as soon as word is received in South Carolina that England and Spain are at war, some 20 Angolan slaves led by the man named Jimmy began marching towards St. Augustine and the promise of freedom. Just 30 miles from the Middleton's Oaks Plantation at the Stono Bridge, they seized a general store where there were arms and powder. They killed the storekeepers and left their heads on the doorstep. What better moment to start an uprising and try to strike out for St. Augustine and find freedom in Florida in the hope that the Spanish authorities are willing to grant freedom to English-speaking slaves who escaped from the Carolinas into Florida. On the march south, the Africans did not kill every white they encountered. They spared Mr. Wallace, an innkeeper they knew to be kind to his slaves. But before the day ended, they had killed more than 20 people. As other slaves joined them, they became an army of almost 100, camped at the Edisto River, 
waiting for others to gather under their flag. The entire force of English North America was going to come down on them because this was an issue not merely for those in South Carolina immediately surrounding this area. This, this was an issue for every European colonist everywhere in the colonies to quash this and to provide some exemplary punishment. Around noon, the nearest white settlers were alerted. By four in the afternoon, they caught up with the Negroes along the Edisto River and fired upon them. Eyewitnesses recorded that the rebels fought boldly, but at least 14 were killed or wounded in the first attack. Others were surrounded, questioned, and then shot. The armed colonists then turned toward Charleston, and on mile post along the way, they left the heads of the executed men. Just the way war transforms people, this terrible transformation into race slavery had changed people by the middle of the 18th century. The, the violence you see at Stono uh, is a violence that had become pervasive in the culture. By the middle of the 18th century, this had become a way of life in the English colonies. Stono was sort of the beginning of the concept that the black population had to be utterly controlled. And the legislation that came out of Stono, the Negro Act, took away whatever liberties the Africans had. Freedom of movement, freedom of assembly. To earn money, to learn to read, all were outlawed. South Carolina imposed duties on all slave importations and encouraged European immigration in order to change the ratio of whites to blacks. The Negro Act became the model for slave laws throughout the mainland of British America. Why do you use those instruments of torture? Are they not fit to be applied by one rational being to another? And are ye not struck with shame and mortification to see the partakers of your nature reduced so low? But above all, are there no dangers attending this mode of treatment? Are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? O lauda, equiano. News of the rebellion traveled quickly to New York, now the third largest city in British America. Most of Manhattan Island was unbroken wilderness, crossed by streams emptying into both the Hudson and East Rivers. By 1740, except for Charleston, South Carolina, no city in colonial America had so high a density of slave population as New York. Crowded onto the southern tip of the island lived 11,000 people, of which more than 2,000 were black. There was really an illusion of intimacy between enslaved blacks and their white slave owners who lived under the same roof. These people could not trust one another. In fact, the slave owners considered the enslaved blacks domestic enemies. New York, November 18th, 1731. Be it ordained by the authority of this city that all Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves that shall die within this city be buried by daylight. <laughs> 
and for the prevention of great numbers of slaves assembling and meeting together at their funerals, under pretext whereof they have great opportunities of plotting and confederating together to do mischief, be it further ordained that not above twelve slaves shall assemble or meet together at the funeral. Minutes of the Common Council of New York. There were probably a lot of other issues going on in New York City at that time that made whites suspicious of blacks. There was, among the lower classes of blacks and whites, a lot of racial amalgamation. There was a lot of activity in the grog shops between blacks and whites, blacks frequenting taverns. New York City was a cosmopolitan place with people from various ethnic groups converging, lots of seamen, and blacks were very much a part of that. In taverns, black men illegally gathered, drank, and mingled with white New York residents. Many enslaved men in New York were hired out by their masters. They had relative freedom of movement and control over their own time. The African-American adult male is seen as the most troublesome, the most intractable, the most rebellious. Those are the persons who are growing in the population. By law, they're not supposed to be out after uh, sunset. By law, they're not supposed to uh, have any currency of their own. By law, they're not supposed to go and gather in numbers uh, of three or greater. By law, they're not supposed to be out drinking, yet every night they're out doing all of these things. There developed in colonial New York City a lively street life amongst black men and uh, enslaved and free. Uh, these black men organized into clubs or uh, gangs, uh, and they were a constant presence on the streets. They even gathered at nights at the docks or in taverns, and they presented according to the English authorities and anxious white residents, a public threat. On March 18, 1741, a fire broke out at Fort George, the governor's official residence. Whipped by violent winds, it burned until a rain shower cooled the blaze, keeping it from torching the entire city. A week later, another fire broke out, and then in the next three weeks, fires raged. As this rash occurs, a sense that there is some evil hand behind this develops. And then people begin to see a black hand. They begin to worry that slaves are behind this, that this is some act of vengeance, that this is some prelude uh, to rebellion. In 1741, England was now at war with Spain, and many of the colonial authorities in New York City feared that the enslaved blacks would have been influenced by the promises from Spain of freedom. It was the English authorities who claimed that they had discovered a combination between enslaved blacks and the lower orders of white town dwellers, transients, and vagabonds to destroy the town, to burn it to the ground, and to set up a black or Negro regime that would owe allegiance to Spain. Just 30 years earlier in New York, Fire had been instrumental in the Negro plot of 1712, where nine whites were killed and five were seriously wounded. Now, the city's officials did not waste any time finding an explanation for the mysterious events. A general dragnet goes out, and just about every African-American male over 16 years of age is taken up and put in uh, in jail, crowded uh, under the, the city hall. The court used the testimony of Mary Burton, a 16-year-old indentured servant, to accuse the alleged conspirators. Burton worked at a tavern and brothel in the city, a business that regularly served black customers. <laughs> 
promised her freedom from servitude, Mary Burton started implicating a constant stream of men and women, some white, but most young black men. For close to four months, black men were dragged into court off New York streets. New Yorkers are so incensed over what they conceive of as a conspiracy that they create this wave of, of paranoia that leads to incredible murders and incredible punishments. It speaks to the whole entrenchment of slavery, even in the North, and also it speaks to racial attitudes as well, that they are very much afraid of racial egalitarianism and people in the lower echelons of their society coming together to form any kind of bond. In May, New Yorkers witnessed the public execution of Caesar and Prince, two black men accused of participating in a robbery connected to the fires. Caesar's corpse was then hung in chains until it decomposed. From the spring of 1741 through the following winter and into the spring of 1742, some 160 slaves and at least a dozen whites were accused of conspiracy against the city of New York. 31 Africans were put to death, 13 of them burned at the stake, and four whites were hung. to Dr. Cadwallad de Colden, Governor's Council, Province of New York. Sir, the horrible executions among you puts me in mind of our New England witchcraft in the year 1692. I am humbly of the opinion that such confessions are not worth a straw, for many times they are obtained by foul means, by force or torment or in hopes of a longer time to live, or to die an easier death. I entreat you not to go on making bonfires of the Negroes and loading yourselves with greater guilt than theirs. For we have too much reason to fear that the divine vengeance does and will pursue us for our ill treatment to the bodies and souls of our poor slaves. Anonymous letter from Massachusetts. The encroachment of slavery in American society that began in Virginia culminated in 1750 with the decision to legalize slavery in Georgia, the last free colony. It had been a little over 100 years since Anthony Johnson first arrived in Virginia. Now slavery existed everywhere in the 13 colonies. But the argument over who would be free and who would be equal had just begun. For generations to come, slavery would continue to trouble the soul of America. When you make men slaves, you deprive them of half their virtue. You set them, in your own conduct, an example of fraud and cruelty, and compel them to live with you in a state of war. Olauda Equiano, enslaved African. 